welcome to the Teachers Oasis. This is a podcast created by the JT for Credit Union. And on this podcast, what we try to do is to help our members to understand how they can get the best out of their financial journey, or how they can make the best of their financial journey. Recently, the organization held a virtual member engagement seminar. This seminar was geared at helping all those in attendance to understand how they can get the best out of their money right now, how they can benefit from what they have saved and how they can grow what they have and how they can keep what they have. We invited finance journalist and founder of Money Media Limited, Kalila Reynolds, to speak to those who were in attendance. This is a summary of what she had to say. We hope you will enjoy it and please look out for other episodes in our podcast. And if you like our content, please make sure that you subscribe. Thank you. So today we're going to cover budgeting, managing debt, and then saving and investing as much as possible because the time is limited and we're going to go about and get this money. Now, let me ask you a question. What is your biggest money problem? You can type it in the chat if you're comfortable telling me on camera or just opening your mic and telling me. I want a volunteer. What is your biggest money problem? Maybe two volunteers to open their mics. Tell me what's your biggest money problem. You can use the not raise hand feature or you can just open your mic. Yes. Not having enough to spend. Not having enough to spend. That's a big one for a lot of people. One more person. What's your biggest money problem? Not being paid enough. Not being paid enough. And those come down to basically the same issue. You don't have enough to spend because you're not being paid enough, right? Those are, are very similar problems. As we get the money, he gone. And it feel like next month, then I will come. As we get the money, he gone, he gone. And to more, make up your confidence. And by Saturday, Lord, don't know where that does. But do not be so much fun than the money. You want to buy feet, but take it and I swear, a long time you don't see it. All right, I think that's the end of the video, but who's relating to Saska right now? Hand to mouth as you get the money, it done. And today's what, 26, huh? So yesterday was payday. You still have money don't left don't get it. Don't, don't. <laughs> Amen, finish before we even receive it in our hand. It's done before you get it. The man said, me get paid on Friday and by Saturday, me don't know what that day. <laughs> if I ever heard a more relatable song, I mean, Sasko hit the nail on the head as we get the money, it done. So today you got paid yesterday for those of you who get paid on the 25th and today, Friday, it's already gone. Can't even enjoy the weekend. So common problems, not earning enough, like we heard somebody say earlier. And then also we're just not being accountable to ourselves about money. So part of the problem, yes, is that we're not earning enough. But another part of the problem is that we don't know where the money is going. We don't know where our own money is going. And the problem with that is that we haven't told our money where to go. So when you don't tell your money where to go, your money is just going to get up and go away. You like, oh, it's just gone on its own. And then you wonder, where did the money go? Didn't I have money? I thought I had enough money. But now I'm looking in my, my purse, my wallet, my bank account, and the money is just gone. It just disappeared and you don't know where it is. And the reason for that is that we're not being accountable to ourselves about our own money. So this brings us to budgeting. But what is a budget? And a lot of people think this is a very scary word. Mm, budget, I don't like that. It's so rigid. It means, and it, it implies a constriction or a restraint, right? When you say, I have to stick to my budget, it's a restraint. The way that most people use it in language or in English, when you say, I have to budget or I have to, you know, really stick to this thing, it's very restraining. It's not, it's not freeing. And it, it's come to be sort of a bad word. We don't want to budget. We don't want to be restrained. We want to just spend our money how we want to spend our money. But what a budget really is, is simply a plan for your money. 
A budget is simply telling your money where to go, how you want to allocate your money. And the thing about budgets is that you need to set goals. You need to set rules for your money. And you also need to plan where your money is going to go. And when I talk about goals, goals are simply the things that you want to achieve financially. Example, you want to buy a house, you want to go on vacation, you want to pay off debt. Um, what are some other common goals? You can type them in the chat. What are some other money goals that you may have? What are some of the things that you want to do with your money right now? Somebody said, I'm embarrassed when I tell my brother I'm treating myself and that is going to Burger King or KFC. <laughs> Uh, Harold says, I'm accountable, but the fact that I am just earning enough. Blue says, pay off debt, then buy a house. A couple people saying, buy a car. Shane says, children's education. All great goals. So things that you just want to achieve financially. But then the next thing is that your goals have to be smart goals. And some of you may have heard this before, but somehow it just, I need it to click. When we say SMART goals, so SMART is an acronym that stands for Specific, Measurable, Achievable, Relevant, and Time-Bound. I noticed when I asked you guys to put in the chat, what are some of your goals? You said things like buy a house. You said things like fund my children's education, purchase a vehicle, children's education, buy a nice car, buy a vehicle, just owning my future. These are not SMART goals. They're, they're goals but they're not smart go goals just yet. So how do you make them smart goals? Well, there are a couple things that you need to do. So example, you want to buy a house. Well, the first step to buying the house is to coming up is coming up with a deposit for the house. So for example, you may need to save $2 million for the deposit to buy a house by 2027. So you see what I did there? I made it a lot more specific. It's measurable. Because now I'm saying exactly how much it is. How much money do I need to achieve this goal? $2 million. And it's time bound. So by when do I want to achieve this goal? By 2027. That is within three years. I wonder if I updated this slide. I don't think I did. Three years. Yeah, I kind of did. Okay, good. So that gives me a basis that I can work with. Now I know that I need $2 million in 36 months, which means that per month, I need to save $55,555. So my SMART goal becomes saving $55,555 every month. And so this is a lot more achievable than thinking, oh, I have this big goal of the $2 million, or I have the bigger goal of the $20 million for the house. Because when you break it down, 20 million means 10% deposit, 2 million, maybe more with the closing costs as well. But let's just work with the 2 million for this example. And now we can see, okay, it actually is 55,000 a month that I really need to save, that I really need to put aside in order to achieve this goal. Now, when I mention rules, rules give you structure on your spending plan. So you have a spending plan, you have a budget but you have not given yourself any spending rules. Like what are the things that you are going to abide by? What are the things that you're going to spend money on and not spend money on? These are where rules come in. And here are some examples. So all spending over $5,000 must be budgeted. So you have a rule that, yeah, if you want to treat yourself to a little frappuccino, that's fine. That's maybe $1,000, $800, depending on where you're buying it, because it's not you know, exorbitant. But if you're going to spend something more than on something that's more than $5,000, it has to be in your budget. Another rule could be no spending on clothes until the credit card is paid off. That's a rule that I gave myself <laughs> when I had a high credit card debt and my weakness was spending on clothes. I'm like, okay, I'm not going to buy any more clothes until that credit card is fully paid off. Another rule could be all windfalls would be allocated 80-20 to stocks or fun. And a windfall is simply unexpected money. So somebody send you some money, maybe somebody give you some money for your birthday, you win cash pot, or you get some unexpected, like maybe there was something that you didn't have to pay for that you thought you were going to have to pay for. So you ended up with extra money. 
I'm going to make a rule on what I'm going to do with that unexpected money. And so my rule that I had set for myself was that it's going to go 80% to stocks and 20% to fun because I want to enjoy the little money that I didn't expect. I do want to have a little fun with it. So 20% of it, I allowed myself to have some fun with that windfall. And the other 80%, I told myself I was going to invest it. Now, if debt is your priority right now, then maybe your windfall should be um, 80% debt, 20% fun. Maybe it should be 100% debt if debt is really crippling you at the moment. Or you can do different parts. You can do 40% debt. 40% investing, 20% fund, however you want to allocate it. But the idea is to just give yourself some rules around how you are going to treat with your money. How are you going to spend money? How are you going to deal with unexpected money? How are you going to allocate out your income? Now, the thing that I want you to take away today, one of the major things is that budgets are actually flexible. So people think of budgets as things that are just rigid, right? That you can't do anything, you can't change anything. Once you set your budget, you must abide by it. And then when you break your budget, you feel guilty. You're like, oh my God, I went over my budget. And then it just dash with a whole budget, right? How many people do that? We do this as well when we're trying to diet, when we're dieting, don't we? We say, I'm going to stick to this diet. And then by day two, you didn't stick to the diet. You're going to have the KFC. And then you say, uh, um, since I already broke the diet, let me just have this ice cream as well because I already <laughs> broke the diet. But no, you don't have to do that because budgets are actually flexible. And if you need to make a change in your budget, you should be able to go into that working document and make that change and adjust accordingly. Because if it means that you want to spend more over here, now you're going to have to adjust something else. And you have to do that minor exercise just to know, okay, where is the money for this thing going to come from? What do I need to cut? Or what additional income do I need to bring in in order to justify this expense or in order to pay for this expense? Your budget is a flexible, breathable, living document that you are in control of. So. Part of your homework, uh, and I'm going to send you these slides, or I'll tell you how to get the slides. Part of your homework is to download an app called Home Budget. It's a free app. It's on Android and Apple. This is the icon. So once you see this icon, you know that this is the right app. Download that app, and then you're going to use it to track your spending for one month. See what I did there? Track. Track your spending <laughs> for one month. And then, so every time you make a purchase, any minor thing, you're going to put it in the app. If you buy uh, cheese tricks, how much cheese tricks cost? I don't even know. If you buy a cheese tricks, you're going to put it in the app. Any little thing, you're going to put it in the app. And a good trick here, if you don't have time, is to just save the receipts and then you log it at the end of the day. But ideally, as soon as you make the purchase, take out your phone put it in the app so that you can see exactly what you're spending money on. And at the end of the month now, you're going to analyze your spending habits and then you're going to set a realistic budget. So not the budget that constrains you, that you feel like, oh my God, there's no way I can live by this budget. And then you end up breaking the budget within a few days. You're going to set a budget based on your actual spending habits. That's what we're going to do. So that is your part of your homework for today. Now, I do have a sample budget here that you can use. Those of you on a computer, you can take out your phone, you can scan this code, and this will take you to my sample budget. And once you enter your email, you'll also get the video that explains how to use the sample budget. And if you have any difficulty with scanning this code, you can also go to buildyourbudgets.com. That's build your budgets with an S at the end, buildyourbudgets.com. You can get the sample budget. And this is a free download. This is one of my gifts to you. I have a few gifts for you today. So download the sample budget at buildyourbudgets.com. So once you've done your tracking for the month, you're going to go in and use this document 
to build your budget. And this is going to be your realistic budget, your spending plan that will guide you for the rest of the year and perhaps years to come. Now, any questions on budgeting before we move on? Let me see. Any questions? I don't see any in the chat just yet. All right. Everybody's quiet. And you guys know you can always raise hand or open your mic if you have a question. So no questions so far on budgeting. Yes, yes thank you very much. question. Thank you very much. I do have a question. Okay, Harold. Yes. Um, what external factors can influence your budget? Because I'm thinking about like inflation. How does inflation um, will affect um, your, your budget or how that can affect your budget? All kind of things can affect your budget. So unexpected expenses all the time. Uh, your car needs a part and it's expensive. You have to, your child needs to go to the hospital and you don't have insurance. And then on top of the hospital bill, you have to pay for the medication that you didn't plan for. School fee raise. Maybe you put in your budget the same school fee as last year, and then you get the invoice from the school, the voucher, what, what you call it, the slip, and you realize, oh, school fee raised, and it raised more than you expected. Because you know they, they raise the school fee every year, and you, you should plan for that. But like last year, for example, they raised the school fees by like 40%, and that's something that you would not have been able to foresee. But the minute that you do get notice of that unexpected expense, you can put it in your budget. But we're going to talk more about inflation a little bit later as well, because I have some tips on how to fight inflation, how to beat inflation. So right now, let's talk about debt. Hey, do you mind paying for this? I don't have any cash. Sure, I'll just put it on my credit card. I'm never going to pay it back anyway. Because I have $30,000 in credit card debt. When they call, I tell them I can't pay it back yet. Credit card debt. Tomorrow, I may buy myself a dining room set or this Boba Fett. Credit, credit card, card debt. Credit card debt. Credit card debt. Credit card debt and debt in general is an issue that plagues a lot of us. And I'll tell you the truth. I have had my own issues with credit card debt. So it is story time once again. You see this little car right here? It's a cute little Nissan March. I took this picture when I was getting ready to sell this car. So I was trying to promote the car, let people know the car is available for sale. But this is the first car that I ever bought like with my own money. Well, not just my money. I went to the bank and I got a loan as well, but on my own. So my first car, my dad actually, actually helped me buy that car. But this little car, I was very proud of because it's the first time that I bought a car on my own with, you know, getting a job, we did the salary deduction, went to NCB and they gave me the loan for this car. I think it was $1.2 million. And I'm almost sure that's how much I paid for this car. And so when they gave me the loan, the loan officer said, you know, when you own a car, you really should get a credit card because cars come with all kinds of expenses. When you, when you get a car, you have to think about insurance. You need all the fees. You have to pay your license, your registration, your fitness fee. You need, um, what if the car needs new tires? Tires are expensive. You need to service your car every three months. That's another big expense. You need various things can go wrong with a car. And so when the loans officer suggested it, I was like, yeah, that makes sense. Because to be honest, I had not planned for insurance <laughs> or fitness fee or any of those additional fees that come with buying this car. I had like exact money to buy the car. And I did not even plan for all these additional expenses. So I say, yeah, sure. Um, give me the credit card. And so I got this credit card, my very first credit card, by the way. And you know what I did with the credit card? Yes, I put the insurance on the credit card. So I it. But not only that, I walked across the street to the boutique and I bought me some nice clothes. And I remember it came up to like $30,000 and this was 10, 15 years ago. 
and thirty thousand dollars was a lot then it's still a lot now but then imagine it was worth it's like 60 grand no and i just bought 30 grand worth of clothes and i just said so wipe it and when school fee time came to pay for my daughter prep school swipe it because normally i would have just you know taken the time the months ahead and saved up every month save a little bit towards the school fee but this time i have a credit card so i'm like no i'm just gonna swipe it and when i need anything i'm gonna swipe it and so that is how i ended up in quite a bit of debt at a fairly young age and silly me i knew that i had to pay it back obviously but what I didn't realize was how the system is designed to keep you in debt, especially when you're using those credit cards. But first of all, let's just look at what is debt and the fear of debt. So debt is simply when you borrow money, when you owe somebody else, right? And let me know in the chat, who is afraid of debt? Or you can open your mic. Who is afraid of debt? Anybody here afraid of debt? Me, me, me. me. So people say, yeah, definitely. Thelma, says, yeah. Thelma says, happy I don't own a credit card, never did. Uh, a few people saying me, Thelma says, so wipe it and she's laughing. And a lot of people in the chat saying me, Shamara says, deadly afraid. So a lot of people are afraid of debt. And I have been in my life afraid of debt as well because of the experience that I had with that credit card. But I realized that it was only because I didn't know how to use it properly. And I didn't realize the system that the financial institutions use to keep us in debt because you can actually win with a credit card. And I said, yes, win with a credit card when you understand the system. So anybody have any idea what is the average interest rate on a credit card in Jamaica? What's the average interest rate? How much are you about paying? About 42%. 42%. 42, 48. 50 percent. I'm glad you guys have an idea because many times I do this presentation and I ask what the average rate is and I hear people say 10%, 15%, 5%. But actually, the average interest rate is 40%. 40%. And that number is even a little bit misleading because it includes us dollar denominated credit cards and those interest rates are usually a lot lower you can go 15 percent, 20 percent the jmd credit cards usually give you the higher interest rates closer to the 40 50 percent so you're looking at 48 percent, 50 51 52 percent interest rate on that credit card and you don't realize it so how do credit cards actually work to keep you in debt if you don't realize it a credit card is simply a loan in your hand. And that's the first thing that you need to understand. A credit card is a loan, but it has the added factor of convenience because they put it in your hand. And so you can make that decision several times a day if you want to borrow money. It's a loan in your hand. But you have to be aware of how the interest on your credit card is calculated. So let's use the example of school fees. And I'm going to assume that somebody on this call has a child in prep school. And depending on the prep school, you're, you could be looking at, say, $100,000 for the term in school fees. Some of these prep schools are very expensive. Some of them are even more than that. Um, so let's say you decide to swipe it like I did and put it on a credit card. So you take your month, sorry, your annual rate. And in this case, we're assuming it's 40% because that's the average and you divide it by 12 and that gives you 3.33% interest. So you multiply the, the amount that you borrowed. This is a very simple calculation. You borrowed $100,000 and you have to phrase it that way. When you say you put it on the card, what you really need to rephrase it as I say, you borrowed $100,000 for the school fee. You borrowed $100,000 and you're paying 3% interest, 3.33% interest. So your total interest payment is $3,330. But here's what they do. They say, you don't need to pay us back this full $100,000 right now. 
This is a loan. Take your time. All you need to do is make the minimum payment. Just pay the minimum payment. And they might say, well, the minimum payment, just pay us $4,000. Just give us $4,000. No, no big deal. And so you go in and you make the minimum payment, not realizing that out of this $4,000, your interest payment alone was $3,330. So only $670 actually went back to paying back the 100,000 that you borrowed. So you're here thinking I borrowed 100,000, I paid back 4,000, and so my balance should be 96,000. But in reality, you borrowed 100,000, they added interest of 3,330, so your balance is 103330 and then you paid back $670. That's all you paid towards the interest. So your balance is now 102000 and some change, right? So you still owe more than what you borrowed, even though you made a payment of $4,000. And this is how they keep you on that debt cycle when you stay making the minimum payment. Now let's take a look at the debt repayment calculator. And this is a document that I created some time ago. And I've shared this with my community inside Money Mission. Is this even updated? Let me see if it is. So let's use our 100,000 example. Let's put $100,000 here. We have an interest rate of 5%. I think what I did in this case, all right, let's, $100,000, we have an interest rate of half a percent. Something is missing on this. I think this starts halfway or something. Let me, I probably was using it for a different exercise and forgot to update it because this should be, yeah, total repayment. So that's 6%. This is, I think I was calculating this for a different type of loan for somebody. So it wouldn't be 0.5%. Let's do the $100,000. And we're doing our interest rate at 3.33%, like we were talking about just now. So at the end of, close mic, close mic, please, somebody. Somebody has their mic on. Wacky Campbell, can you please turn off your mic? All right, good. So you borrowed a hundred thousand dollars in April. Major. This is definitely not right. April, May. Why did it go to March? January, February. Let's let's call it January then. February. You borrowed a hundred thousand dollars in January, and you're repaying at the monthly rate of three point three three percent. Your interest is 3000 and change. And when you add the interest, it's $100,000. Your minimum payment, they tell you pay 4000 So let's see how long it would take you to pay back that 100000 paying just the minimum payment every month. At the end of the year, you would still owe 90000 Do you get that? You borrowed 100000 you're paying 4000 every month, and that's 12 payments of 4000 so you've paid a total of 48000 So how come at the end of the year, you still owe 90000 It's because the vast majority of the payments went towards interest. You paid $38,311 in interest. That's how much you paid. And so you still owe this massive number. You've been paying $4,000 a month, and you only made a $10,000 debt, a dent in your credit card debt. So you can use this calculator to figure out how much do you need to pay to get this number to zero at the end. So let's try $10,000. That should do it, right? Because that... 12 payments of 10,000 should do it. 
12 payments of 10,000 is 120,000, right? But at the end, we still have a small balance of 3,000 and change. So it takes, it's going to take us uh, 13 months to totally pay off this $100,000 debt with a payment, a minimum payment of $10,000 a month. And so these are the things that I want you to be very, very aware of. I hope you guys were seeing that screen. You're seeing that screen, right? With the debt repayment calculator? Yeah. Okay, good. Let me get back to, see if I can get back to, um, how do I get back to my slide? I think I need to minimize something here. Okay, found it. Here it is. You're seeing it now, right? You're seeing the slide? Yes. Yes, we're seeing it. All right. So you got to be very, very aware of that. There is something known as debt consolidation. That is a strategy for helping you to repay your debts. You can lump all your debts together, roll them into one big ball. Usually you can get a lower interest rate, especially if it's credit cards. You can get a lower interest rate and it's basically using debt to pay off debt. But the advantage of doing that is that you're using a lower interest rate to pay off a higher interest rate so you can pay it off a lot faster. Now, there are ways to use debt the right way or use debt to your advantage. So I actually love credit cards despite everything that I just told you about them. Uh, for one, it's a zero interest loan when you pay it back in full by the due date. So if I buy something today, and the payment is not due until the 25th of next month, I can basically borrow the money for that. No, because maybe I don't have the money, but I'm getting money in two weeks uh, or whenever because I'm self-employed. So money comes not necessarily consistently. Uh, money comes in in a lumpy kind of way for me. And it may be that you have somebody that's going to send you some money. They haven't sent it yet. You can get a 0% interest loan if you are disciplined enough to pay it back in full by the due date. A lot of them also offer rewards, especially cash back. You can get on some cards up to 3%, 4%. I've even seen 5% cash back, which simply means that whatever value you spend, they give you back the money. So 5% cash back on $100,000 is $5,000 in free money that you can use to spend on whatever. It's a, ballot, it's a credit on your account. You also have flexible payments. They're more secure than cash. Uh, people, some people, you know, this could be debatable. Some people may debate this because what if they steal your credit card? But the good thing is that if they steal your credit card, you can report it. And many times you are not liable for that amount once you can show that it was stolen and somebody used it without your permission. Whereas if that happens to your debit card, you're not going to get back that money. And if that happens to cash, you're definitely not getting back that money. So it's more secure than cash and other forms of payment. And of course, it's very convenient because like I said, it's a loan in your hand or a loan in your pocket. You need money that you don't have at the moment. You always have this avenue uh, to use. Now, you can also use credit cards to your advantage. You can use debt to create or at least to help you get towards the path of wealth creation. You can use low interest debt to pay off high interest debt, such as debt consolidation, which I told you about before. You can also use low interest debt to fund high return investments, which is a riskier way of using debt. But it is what is known in finance as leverage, and it's what business people use all the time. Investors use it all the time. Entrepreneurs use it all the time. They take out a loan to invest in this particular product launch or this business idea, this thing that they're about to do that could potentially give them a high return, but they have to also be cognizant of the potential risks involved. Now, DJ! Run the tune. We know about sardines, pop quills, bully beans, chicken foot, chicken neck, chicken pop. Something now we are smoking now, that's when. Money me a look away over there. 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 Money me a look 